I'm here in Las Vegas at CES. And right now I'm going to be interviewing James Park, the CEO and founder of Fitbit. James, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me, Dana. Yeah, so Fitbit on uh, wearables, obviously huge at this show. Um, and a lot of it started really with Fitbit. I hear people mention Fitbit the way they would say Kleenex for a tissue. When they say Fitbit, they really just mean fitness tracker. Um, and here we are, uh, tons of fitness trackers at the show, tons of wearables and mm -hmm. smart watches in general. Um, just wanted to sort of get a state of the union from you on the category. Yeah, um, actually really, it's every year there's more and more fitness trackers. I'm always shocked by the number. Um, but yeah, I, my co-founder Eric and I started Fitbit almost eight years ago. Um, well before the whole you know, idea of wearables and fitness tracking was hot. Um, in fact, in the early days, we had a lot of skepticism, especially amongst investors, as to whether this whole category was actually going to be something or not. And it's kind of, it's kind of funny to think back on those days where um, you know, fitness tracking and wearables, it seems like so, something so obvious. But um, back in those days, it was actually a struggle. Um, so it's been fun and rewarding. It's, so I want to talk about the category as a whole, but it, where a good place to start might actually be the device on your okay. wrist, because I think it showcases how even Fitbit has evolved over the past few years. For viewers at home, can you maybe give us a, some hands-on time or give yeah, us a walkthrough so of what you've got This is um, one of the products that we announced uh, late last year and just started uh, shipping this week. We announced we're shipping at CES. So this is a Fitbit Surge. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a watch foremost. You can pick from a lot of different clock faces. Um, swipe through stats, so I've walked about 7,800 steps today. Uh, has always on continuous heart rate, so you can see that my heart rate's 82. Uh, my resting heart rate's typically about 60, so I'm about 20 beats per minute higher than my rest, so um, I guess I'm slightly nervous, but not, not yeah. too much. <laughs> um, kind of embarrassing to show that. Uh, the distance that I've traveled, um, calories that I've burned, uh, floors that I've climbed, and then um, there's a bunch of different apps that you can pick from as well. It has eight sensors on board, so mm. GPS, uh, altimeter, accelerometer, gyroscope, compass. Allowing it to basically be a proper sp sports watch. Yeah, it's yeah. a combination of a fitness tracking watch and a smart watch. So it does caller ID, text notifications, things like that. So. Yeah, so I mean, let's talk about that evolution. Um, so already here at the show, we see a lot of not just fitness trackers, but we see smartwatches that attempt to do fitness tracking. They probably don't do quite as good of a job as a dedicated fitness tracker like a Fitbit. Um, and we, we've also seen um, more hardcore sports watches. Um, I just wanted to sort of just ask you about the evolution of the category. What is your take on smartwatches? Um, should Fitbit be getting into that space, or is there still a reason to maybe stick with a more dedicated fitness tracker? Yeah. So. Our focus and really what the Fitbit brand stands for is fitness tracking. Um, and I don't see a straying from that mission, primarily because um, I think one of the problems with general purpose smartwatches is no one's really figured out why a consumer would want to wear one of these devices. Um, there's been a lot of efforts from Samsung, all the vendors in the Android Wear ecosystem, um, you know, obviously Apple Watch. If anyone can figure it out, you know, how to make a general purpose smartwatch compelling, it's probably Apple, but I think the jury's probably still out. Um, but for us, over the past eight years, um, all of our customers have grown to love the features and the promise of our brand around fitness tracking. So I think for us, it's something where we're going to stay focused on it. One other thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, I don't know how many other wearables you've seen at the show, but fashion is also just a really big theme. We've seen some uh, wearables here covered in crystals. We've seen some that actually do a more convincing job of looking like a real watch. Um, and I know that Fitbit already has a partnership with Tory Burch. Right. I just want to get a sense of what is on the future, um, what's on, on the horizon for you guys in terms of style? What else can you guys be doing to make people feel more comfortable in their yeah, devices. Definitely, um, as this category grows, uh, fashion's be going to become a much more important element. I mean, we have we announced our partnership with Tory Burch. Uh, Tory developed a line of pendants and bracelets, different bands, and I think um, when they when Tory announced the collection, it sold out in several hours. So that was a huge success. Mm -hmm. uh, I know there's the Swarovski crystal wearables from Misfit. 
Um, I know Apple's made a huge deal about a lot of different bands. Um, you know, for us, I think we're going to try to incorporate a lot of uh, different fashion partnerships over the next few years, and I think that's going to be a common theme. Um, I think you can kind of overdo it as well. Uh, you know, I've seen some partnerships where it's maybe a little too high end and not really approachable for the mass consumer, but I think that's also what's exciting about this whole category is that people are just experimenting and seeing what works. Fitbit's approach, too, to some extent, has involved integrating more with other kinds of hardware. So, for instance, you can enjoy the Fitbit experience on, let's say, an iPhone or some Android phones without even having to own the band. So, um, yeah, so does that mean, the, in a way, that the app is and the ecosystem are most important above all? Um, the software is definitely important. Um, we do allow people to track some basic stats using just their phone. But what we found is um, even with the motion coprocessor on the iPhone, um, people try it out and it's a great way to get introduced to the notion of fitness tracking. But for people who really want to understand their 24-7 um, fitness lifestyle, a dedicated device is still what people want to upgrade to. Um, but we offer both options. Um, I think what's helped us a lot is our cross-platform support. So we support over 150 different devices from Windows to Android to iOS, and that's really important because a lot of what makes um, our devices really successful is the social layer. So you can compete against friends and family, and if your parents are on Android and you're using an iPhone, you don't want that incompatibility to prevent you from you know, beating one another and yeah. fitness that. So. So we're just entering 2015, and you guys just unveiled new hardware. So it's probably going to be a little while before we see any new devices. I'm wondering what your team's priority is in ter priorities are in terms of working on the app. What are the biggest things that you think, the most important things you think that you can add to the app? Yeah, so actually, um, you know, right now Fitbit's about 500 people, mostly in San Francisco. A um, lot of engineering talent, and two-thirds of our engineers are actually software engineers. Um, so we place a lot of emphasis on the software. Uh, some of the cool things that we're about to launch is multi-device support. So you can have multiple Fitbits tied to your account. Uh, so for instance, you might not want to wear the Fitbit Surge, which is a watch all day. You might just want to wear it working out. So you can wear a Fitbit Flex, which is a more minimalist band throughout the day, and then when you're working out, switch That's to That's a feature Surge. you guys have or that you're uh, rolling it's, out? It's about, it's, we should launch it pretty shortly. Oh, very so, good. Yeah, That's something that people have asked for for quite a while. I think we're going to spend a lot of time uh, improving the social experience as well. Uh, more different types of challenges, um, communications, et cetera. So. Um, as an end user, and I don't mean this specifically as a Fitbit user, but as a user of fitness trackers and devices in general, for me, my two pain points are sleep tracking and that it's not always accurate and uh -huh. food logging and that it can just be a big pain in the butt. Um, what are the ways in which Fitbit can make those two things better and easier? Yeah, so for sleep tracking um, with our latest devices, uh, with our earlier devices, you actually had to press a button to put it into sleep mode and out of sleep mode. With our latest devices, you actually don't have to do anything. We automatically recognize when you're entering sleep and when you w wake up. So you get all that data uh, without having to do a lot of work, and that's been really powerful for people. Uh, food logging, I think, improving that is a little bit more problematic. Yeah, what um, are the challenges with that? Uh, you know, it's, um, if you don't stick to packaged foods, I think it's really hard to do food logging and a lot of people find it to be tedious. Um, but in some ways it actually works in the benefit of the user. It makes you more disciplined and more uh, cognizant of what you're eating. But everyone recognizes that it's pretty hard. I think it's just really hard to crack the code on making it easier. Um, I know my fitness pal is, definitely the most popular food logging app out there and we integrate with them, but it's still hard to use and I, I don't know the answer. It's tough, I mean I've used Weight Watchers in the past and yeah. I think even their app needs a lot of work. I think yeah. they have- Points make it easier, but only to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean what I would love to see is for a company like Weight Watchers or something similar to give all you guys, all you fitness tracker makers, uh -huh. access to their database, which is really rich and has a lot of foods and recipes pre-stored. Um, and have you guys take care of the technological and the app design. Um, yeah, that will definitely be a part, powerful uh, yeah. partnership and integration. Um, so. But, yeah, food logging. Um, is, that a, is that a feature do you think that users care about quite as much, or do you think? Um, 
people do care about it. I mean, one of our most requested features was barcode scanning okay. for food logging. So we added that uh, last year. But I don't think there's any silver bullet on you know, searching your food database and logging. We try to make it convenient. We allow favorites and bookmarks and things like that. But um, you still have to be pretty disciplined. Yeah. I know that some of your competitors, you as of fairly recently, have some competitors that are selling their fitness trackers for pretty low prices. I've mm -hmm. seen them as low as either 30 or $12 a year for a $12 a year subscription where you get the hardware for free. Right. Um, the trade-off seems to be that they give up a lot of features that Fitbit offers. They give up the sleep tracking, they give up the food logging. What's your take on that? model, how many features do you think people are willing to give up versus getting that low price? Yeah, if, if you, um, so NPD uh, is a group that tracks retail point of yep. sales data in North America. And um, you know the affordable uh, $25 to $50 activity tracking devices um, actually don't sell as well as the really? higher, priced, um, higher priced devices. And that's primarily because consumers right now still demand uh, more features. Uh, so for instance, in our latest devices, we introduced 24-7 continuous heart rate tracking. Um, and I think that's a feature that people find really compelling and are willing to spend money for. So um, for now, the $60 Fitbit device is probably the least expensive we'll see for a little while. Uh, yeah, it's our most affordable device. Uh, we sell a lot of uh, Fitbit zips at $60 to companies as part of their corporate wellness programs. But I think for consumers, uh, consumers are really concerned about the health and fitness and they're still willing to pay a lot of money for the latest uh, features in their devices. Great. Going back to software design for a minute, um, there's always this question of once you collect all this health data, um, what can you do with it and how can you use it to help people live a healthier lifestyle? Um, Tell me about where Fitbit can still go with that and what work you guys can still do in yeah. that area. So we have one of the largest personal biometric databases in the world. Um, we do have a premium service where we offer deeper analytics for people, but I think um, a lot of what we're going to see over the next year or two are um, deeper insights, coaching, and guidance based on all of this data to help people reach their health goals. Um, I think that's going to be pretty exciting. It's just been a little bit challenging to figure out how we can make sense of all this data. Absolutely. I mean, a, a device I tested recently was the Basis Peak. And on the one hand, I was impressed by how many sensors it had. On the other hand, I don't necessarily know the value of knowing what my skin perspiration is. So yeah. that does seem like the big question, right? Um, yeah. How do you take that information and help people change their behaviors? Well, Getting I think people to change their behaviors is hard to begin with, I think. Yeah, I think um, that, that brings up another interesting point. We're actually pretty careful about how many sensors we put in our devices um, because having the best device doesn't necessarily mean having the most sensors in it mm -hmm. because some of the data points aren't as useful. It can be overwhelming to consumers and you also have to make trade-offs in terms of the product design. The uh, product might have to be bigger, more expensive if, if you try to do too much. Um, so there's definitely a lot of tension between different things you can include. Um, Again, I think you know a lot of companies, including ourselves, are hiring a lot of data scientists to make sense of the data. I think um, Fitbit and a lot of our competitors have, in the early years, just been really uh, involved in just making sure the basics work well, which is actually still pretty hard because, uh, so for, for instance, the state of Bluetooth syncing on Android, it's still a little bit spotty due to um, the stability of the Bluetooth stack on Android devices and the fragmentation of different Android versions on different handsets. So that actually consumes a lot of engineering resources. Uh, I think we're just starting to get ahead of that. And that's what's exciting because we can start to do a lot of things around data insight and invest a lot more software engineering resources on things that are hopefully more useful to consumers. Okay, great. And um, I want to talk a bit in our last few minutes here a little bit about um, the Wi-Fi scale. Um, okay. What kind of progress can you guys make there? What do you think is on the horizon for um, either the scale or just other kinds of household um, or integrated products you guys might have? Yeah, I think um, you know we definitely want to include a lot more different devices that we might not necessarily do ourselves, whether that's you know things like blood pressure, blood glucose, I think all those make sense. Um, in terms of uh, connected scales and body fat scales. Uh, I'll be the first to admit, it's a little bit hard to innovate on that front um, because mm -hmm. there's, you know, you can make 
your scale more accurate. Um, th those are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, people have asked for better multi-user identification. Um, so those are all things that we're looking at. But I'll be the first to admit, it's hard to innovate on a bathroom right. scale. Okay, We've tried. fair enough. So. <laughs> Tell me more about these integrated products though. I mean, it does seem like if Fitbit already has the ecosystem and the platform, uh -huh there is an opportunity for it to be in other kinds of gadgets that people use to otherwise monitor their health or wellness. Yeah. So we've had an open API for several years now. We have over 2,000 partners integrated mm -hmm. into our ecosystem, including MyFitnessPal, RunKeeper. Uh, we just announced Strava integration, yep. um, which will be pretty awesome for runners and cyclists. Um, so uh, over time, I think, uh, we haven't really emphasized this as much, but I think uh, there's a lot of data uh, flowing in to Fitbit, um, the platform, not just from our own devices, but from all our partners as well. And that's exciting for users because we can help make sense of all that for them over time. Okay, great. Have any favorite thing you've seen at the show? Uh, there's so much going on over at the Sands, it's kind of crazy. Um, what really sticks out for you? A uh, lot of crazy things. Um, I think I saw a smart razor, which I'm not sure what it's good for, but... It's just a uh, shaving razor? Yeah, shaving razor. I haven't seen that. Yeah, so um, I think uh, unvarnished capitalism at its best, <laughs> going over at the sands, so. Very nice, well thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Everybody, this is James Park, CEO and founder of Fitbit. James, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.